morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, UNIMA members, and audiences joining from around the world. My name is Reiko Yoshida, and I am the head of the programs and stakeholders outreach unit at the Diversity of Cultural Expressions entity at UNESCO. It is my honor to represent UNESCO in this Resiliart debate. Puppetry is extremely diverse, yet universal at the same time. It's ever evolving art forms, pursuit of artistic freedom and contributions to communities embody the spirit of UNESCO's work in culture. They're especially relevant to the UNESCO 2005 Convention on the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions, and also the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Culture Heritage. The COVID-19 crisis has decimated the culture sector across the board. The performing arts industry, which rely on shared spaces and experiences has gotten a particularly severe blow. Many community-based theaters fear that the prolonged closure will become permanent. Today, we are at the risk of losing small, yet very powerful voices in the arts. And this is why on 15th of April, 2020, last year, UNESCO launched the Resili Art Movement to provide, to provide a platform for cultural professionals to speak up and to be heard. To this day, more than 240 debates have been organized involving more than 110 countries. And as you know very well, UNEMA has been one of the most active organizers of all. While the obstacles faced by artists are enormous and so many, one challenge that was shared by panelists from all regions was the social and economic precariousness of cultural practitioners. Sadly, these issues are not new. The pandemic didn't create these issues. They merely exacerbated. And in 1980, the recommendation concerning the state of the artist was adopted at UNESCO, and it calls the member states to address the lack of social security available to artists, insufficient safeguarding measures for artistic freedom, and limited training opportunities. Some 40 years later, we still have a long way to go. The year 2021 is a watershed mo moment for the puppetry and the cultural and creative industries at large. How we, re how we rebuilt and position culture in the COVID-19 recovery plans, we have a long lasting impact on the flourish and dignity of the creative communities. This year is also the International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development. And UNESCO will highlight the creative sector's economic contributions, such as job creation and income generation, but also the social contributions such as solidarity and tolerance. And these are all essential in ingredients for stronger and more re resilient post-COVID societies. In 2020, we also witnessed remarkable inventiveness and resilience from artistic communities. And the puppetry world is no exception. The UNIMAS Resilient Art Debate Series, 19 national and international discussions were held from China to Venezuela, Mexico to Bel Bel Belgium, India, Finland, the Republic of Korea, and many more. Unima Resilient Art shows the puppetry's potential to promote and facilitate intercultural dialogue in a world where travel restrictions increase and borders remain sealed. It is therefore an immense pleasure for UNESCO to mark this landstone of the 20th Resilient Art Debate as a partner. The International Puppetry Day is an opportunity 
to honor puppetry's dynamism, historical richness, and community of artists who continue to contribute to our well being. And tomorrow, UNESCO will be joining the puppetry community in this celebration. Thank you very much, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Idoya, if you want yes. to speak. Thank you, Reiko. Uh, dear members of UNIMA, dear representatives uh, from UNESCO, dear friends, today um, it's a, a special day for this uh, Resilier series because today we are finishing this series of roundtables that as, uh, as Mrs. Yoshida said, is uh, an initiative uh, from UNESCO that uh, UNIMA joined uh, in June uh, last year with the first transnational roundtable, which was followed by three of the same scope and then 15 uh, national ones, uh, during which we have been able to realize the terrible impact that the pandemic uh, has had on the cultural field in the fifth continent. Uh, with this, uh, that makes uh, the number 20th uh, organized together with UNESCO. Uh, for us, it is, it is a great honor. With this, we finish this series and it is a great honor for us because it is organized together with UNESCO and after 61 years of uh, being member of UNESCO, as, uh, as you know, uh, UNIMA is member of UNESCO, and uh, 41 years uh, having the consultative uh, statutes of uh, organization in UNESCO is the first uh, important debate that we organize together with UNESCO. So for us, it's a great honor. And in this special situation that we are living. Um, in some countries, as, uh, such as uh, Germany, France, or Spain, uh, the governments uh, have helped the, the artists uh, to some extent. But even so, the situation is extremely difficult. The artists are, as we have uh, seen in the debates we have had, the artists are in a very, very difficult situation. From UNIMA, even being an association with limited uh, financial means, we have tried to help uh, the artists in some ways uh, through the aid campaign coordinated by the Cooperation Commission, a crowdfunding campaign through which we have helped uh, 263 families from 15 countries. These families were in a really desperate situation. We know it's not a, a big uh, number, but we do what, uh, we, we, what we can. Another way to help is uh, the cancellation of uh, membership fees of the, of the centers. The centers are, uh, some centers are in a really very, very bad situation, so they cannot even pay the, the, the membership fees uh, to the international, to the, to the association. So we condemn them to, to pay the, the membership uh, fee. Uh, to those that have uh, really uh, big uh, financial problems. And finally, uh, we help them also being together with those people that, uh, that are uh, having these uh, big problems, uh, linking them to one to the other and trying to help them in the same way we can. Listen, listening them, and being with them, that I think that sometimes this is also very important. So uh, we are always uh, willing to listen to them and to try to help them. Uh, the 19 round uh, tables that we have done so far have shown us the fragility of the puppetry art. But at the same time, they have taught us the great capacity and the great future that the puppetry art has, such as, for instance, the distance learning or online exhibitions. Our institutions 
must be aware of the enormous potentials of the puppetry art, of the economic, economic values of the culture, and they couldn't, they mustn't be, they couldn't let us alone. They must help us in these moments that we are suffering so much. For instance, in, East, in Spain, we have just finished a study that indicates that 30% of the total of theater spectators, 30% are from puppet theater. This is a very big uh, amount of spectators, 30%. And the turnover for the year 2018 was 55 million of euros. So this indicates the huge potential of the puppetry art. So I think that the, gover the governors, the institution should be aware of that. They cannot let puppetry art as they have been doing up to now, as if the puppetry art is something, um, it's uh, like the, the small the brother. No, puppetry art is a big art and they must take uh, attention, pay attention to our art. But we are not here to listen to me. We are here to listen to the important panelists that we, are, that we have here. So uh, I'm not going to, to speak longer, but uh, I want to thank you very much to, to the panelists that are here with us. I want to thank very much to UNESCO for, for the opportunity that they are giving us today for this uh, big window they have opened to us to, to be able to, to speak about our art and to, to show the people the, the importance of puppetry art at the, at the situation that the puppetry art is, is having in many countries today. And, um, well, that's all for today. I want to give the floor to, to Margareta Sorenson, that is the president of the International Association of Theater Critics. I want to take advantage also today uh, to thank uh, Audrea Soleil for having um, be able to write, uh, to for have wrote the, the wonderful message she has wrote for the World Puppetry Day that as all of you know is tomorrow. And Margareta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
So thank you. And uh, here is where the round table starts. And first of all, thank you to Reiko Yoshida and UNESCO and Idoya Otegi and Unima for giving such beautiful start off platforms with a lot of information on the situation uh, of how these two organizations helped uh, puppeteers and the art of puppetry in the world. I'm, I will present the panelists and I think I and all the panelists, we are very honored to be in this 20th um, Resiliart where we can conclude and kind of for this time close the box of so many information that has been uh, spread in the world during this pandemic year, which truly was a difficult year in many senses, but also gave um, curiosity and creativity and inventiveness a new chance in, in all the arts. So today, the, the, this round table, uh, I will present who is who and, and um, first and maybe most honorable of us all is Nancy Staub from uh, US, the Atlanta. She's working, uh, she's an advisor of the Center of Puppetry Arts, a scholar, and she knows everything about puppetry and how rich this tradition is and how many faces it has. Next uh, is uh, to present is Fabrizio Montecchi from Italy. Uh, running a shadow theater. Already this indicates that puppetry is many different kinds of theater. And this is uh, the most famous pup, uh, shadow theater in Europe, I would say. Next with us is Gilbert Ag Agbevide, uh, who is a puppet theater producer in Togo. And with us from Togo, the youngest participant in the panel is Oksana Biliba, who is a member of a Russian theater group, a puppet theater group uh, outside of Moscow. And last but not the least, because he is also president of UNIMA, is Dadi Pundumye, who is a uh, puppeteer and also puppet director running a puppet theater company in India that just went on tour and maybe now is back. And uh, did, I hope I did not forget to say something important about anyone, but uh, we will try to have this uh, round table as conversation-like as possible. So it, everyone is allowed to put questions and to interfere, but we have made a structure that we will first talk about the pandemic. But as, a, as you know, I'm a theater critic so I might be more interested in aesthetics than in economics and how an art form develops. And I think already before the pandemic, uh, puppetry is among the uh, stage arts, which is uh, most developing right now, I think. It's very inventive and it also is able to develop technical means, which maybe not all other theater forms might do. So we will talk about aesthetics as well as uh, economy and social issues. And of course, they, it, they are, have been very difficult. Um, for instance, uh, I will turn first to Fabrizio, who will tell us a little about his own um, discovery of, uh, you know, in the world, many people see uh, puppet theaters are very small. Some of them are only touring and uh, the old tradition was it was family companies even so that's not no longer very often the case but it's still there are still some but uh, i think Fabrizio, you kind of discovered also how vulnerable uh, this art form might be because it is has such free uh, tra the tradition is very free and a bit bohemic what would you like to say about this Uh, there is no sound, Fabrizio. Uh, I cannot hear you. So, uh, okay. I come from Italy, and in Italy there is a strong uh, tradition. It's very important. All, all uh, many, many tradition, very regionalist uh, tradition. So, I think that the the the, the theme 
of the relation between the tradition and innovation is uh, very, very important. And for this, I think that uh, some, uh, I think that now important to overcome the dichotomous mentality to see tradition and uh, innovation uh, as opposed and uh, in uh, opposition. In puppetry, this mentality, I don't know if all over the world, but in general, this mentality, uh, it's very strong and often has deleterious effect on our art because uh, it brings uh, useless contracts and uh, conflicts. Proponents uh, of innovation tend to think that tradition is the defense of borders with impossible walls. While on the part of the supporters of tradition, that think that innovation is the abolition of any border. The champions of tradition attribute to it a sort of moral superiority, while the champions of uh, innovation claim is a uh, aesthetic uh, superiority. In reality, we think with this mentality confuse, I think the correct uh, meaning of the terms. Tradition does not mean traditionalism, which instead defines a truly conservative and reactionary attitude. At the same time, innovation does not mean a revolution because it does not mean sudden change of state and uh, above all, it does not mean the destruction of tradition. So the tradition is not immutable, but is subject to change uh, of a very long time. Uh, whoever uh, it, uh, defends its rule and form and its uh, conservation as its primary purpose. Despite this, the tradition evolves all the time under innovative pressures that cannot be held back. For this reason, all cultures, even the artistic ones, develop as the constantly evolving intersection between a heritage and the down from the past and the continuous needs for innovation, innovation that arise. In fact, tradition and innovation must always be considered together as two sides of the same coin. There is no identity, I think, without memory of the origins. There is no innovation without tradition. So my question is when we finally uh, be able to overcome these uh, 20th century dichotomies and create a new pact or a new alliance between tradition and innovation in the puppet theater. Thank you. Uh, you also had an idea about these rather small companies are often more vulnerable and there is a need for also puppetry artists to try to be, build uh, more solid institutions. Yes, yes. I think, uh, uh, this is a, a, a very important themes for me, uh, very political in, in, in uh, that our sector uh, must not only be culturally promoted, but uh, also socially protected. This is very important, which does not mean that it must be assisted, but that it must be recognized. But for this uh, recognition, to take place, we must first get out of that isolation in which we often lock ourselves in. Because many of the critical issues in our sector are common to the other sector of the theater. And it's therefore essential, essential to open up network dialogue with the world that uh, surround us and develop trans-sectoral synergistic uh, actions. But my impression, however, is that in the world of uh, puppet theater, there is a great resistance on the part of many to open up, to overcome a kind of anarchist individualism that sees institutions as a danger for the artistic work. Considered 
uh, the only the artist only creator of uh, himself these uh, artists or uh, these artistic groups who live uh, without access to public uh, contribution and therefore with merit only from their work seem to prefer a certain social marginality rather than being subjected to constraints and the condition imposed by other. This choice must be respected for me, but it makes it difficult for the social recognition I was talking about before, uh, and which our sector and the crisis produced by the health energy as shown, absolutely needs to grow and to look to the future. The choice to live on the margins is legitimate, but concern the individual artist, not an entire sector. A community must always work for new generations. And today, the new generation need strong institutions, institution that defends their rights, institutions for training, institution for professionalization. The free and casual approach uh, with uh, which our generation grow up is not longer enough. My question is, are we willing to have uh, this social recognition to carry out a cultural battle within ourselves? Thank you. Thank you again. And, and my impression, again, as a critic, is that uh, um, puppetry is all over. It is in, in the opera houses, in the other theaters, in dance, and uh, it's really all over the place. And it's a bit strange that anyone could have this feeling that it is so uh, marginalized, as I know it often is. We are going to uh, uh, have a look on and to uh, go to Nancy and first we will see some um, pictures, but I would just say one very, the best known uh, sector of puppetry for normal audiences is of course entertainment. And we mustn't forget that this was a, a, big, a big part of puppetry during uh, centuries and, and longer than that, that it was entertaining. And it is uh, the Central Puppetry Arts in Atlanta where, for which uh, Nancy is an advisor was founded by uh, Jim Henson and uh, it's closely linked to the Muppets, one of the most successful um, puppetry um, uh, examples ever and a clear case of entertainment, but a very qualified one. I think we should have a look at uh, a little video from um, uh, this Center of Puppetry Arts, and then Nancy will speak and comment on what we just saw. Right, Nancy? That's the way we right. decided. Yeah. yeah so we will, yeah, we will see it first. In 1978, Kermit the Frog with Jim Henson cut the ribbon on the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia. Today, the center is the largest nonprofit in the U.S. dedicated to the art of puppetry. Welcoming over 160,000 visitors a year, the center presents over 600 full-scale puppetry performances each season. Its education department offers more than 50 unique programs, including their Create a Puppet Workshop, where children can extend their theater experience by creating a theme-based puppet of their very own. The Center's Worlds of Puppetry Museum contains over 4,000 puppets and artifacts, including the largest collection of Jim Henson puppets in the world, along with an immense global collection of puppets from nearly every tradition around the world. For over 20 years, the Center's Digital Learning Department has provided interactive workshops and puppet shows from its digital studios at the Center. As a pioneer in distance learning, the center's digital team has honed its skills and refined its abilities to deliver and develop 
purpose-built educational programming. Programming that has been presented in all 50 states and more than 88 countries. In February, the Center celebrated Black History Month by putting a conversation with black theater artists in the spotlight to share their stories of struggle and success so that young people of color everywhere could envision a future in the arts for themselves. The center also presented Stories of Color, a live interactive workshop featuring the power of folk tales from the African diaspora. And the center released its archival video of its acclaimed production of Ruth and the Green Book. As the world struggles to teach and interact online, the center continues to do what it's done for decades, deliver accessible, award-winning, curriculum-based programming to anyone, anywhere. So please tell us, you're uh, pioneers in distance learning, and I know that during the pandemic years, uh, many others did uh, tryouts and, and try to uh, follow you, your uh, good example. Please, Nancy. Well, first of all, I want to say Vincent Anthony was the founder and executive director of the Center for Puppetry Arts. Uh, Jim was a very avid supporter and he helped cut the ribbon and he came every year and he gave funding and gave puppets but the credit goes to Vincent Anthony for creating the Center for Puppetry Arts. And it's been my pleasure to be involved with the museum. I gave them a small collection at one point and Vince got the idea to make a proper museum and it's now, as you saw, it's grown exponentially. And I would just like to point out that the center had created a, a studio for trans, Meeting digital learning programs, as they mentioned ahead of time. So they were well conditioned to take advantage of this pandemic problem. Having won several awards, they even had to open a second studio. When in March 2020, the center had to close its theaters, it offered free programming through digital learning and saw its research increase exponentially across the globe. In spring 2020, it, there were viewers in all 50 states and 88 countries, as mentioned on the video. That included 7,637 hours of viewing, 37,500 hits on Facebook, a 1,474% growth from previous 90 days. So during the pandemic, CPA digital programming is reaching new audiences all over the world. But innovation and expansion cannot be sustained on digit ticket sales alone. So there's the good and the bad. We're getting exposure with growing audiences, but how could we survive? And it's not just a center for puppetry arts, of course. It's centers, puppet theaters, puppet artists all over the world and all over all of the Americas. And anyone who wants to get access to the program knows, of course, to go to the UNAMA website and to the websites of all the UNAMA centers to get the links. By the way, I'm not so much honorable as old. I'm the oldest here, I think. <laughs> I don't know about honorable. <laughs> and the wisest, maybe. <laughs> uh, and you also made an exhibition online uh, during the pandemic uh, year, right? And uh, I think that has inspired also others. And uh, this is a good example of uh, the inventiveness among uh, puppet artists. Um, the, the, Actually, I've written articles about doing online exhibitions. There are quite a few all over the world now, but we have yet to do our own. And that's one of my aims is to make a virtual exhibit, not a virtual tour because there are many of those, but they're kind of like promos because they just dash around the exhibition and stop in front of a booth. So I don't find that so interesting. And there are virtual guided tours where an individual uh, curator walks around and tells you but if you look at the Smithsonian digital programming, they take, let's say a piece of fabric from a costume, then they show the costume, then they'll show the person wearing the costume, maybe show a performance. So a virtual exhibition can really give a wonderful insight into every field, including puppetry. And I hope to do one soon. 
Yeah, and the one mentioned in the video, uh, which is uh, was exposed during the month of Black History, or did I misunderstand this? Uh, no, that's right. The different times we have different programming, especially for the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, like whether it's Chinese New Year's or Black History Month or whatever. Uh, teaching with puppetry is an important part. We teach it about puppetry, and we use uh, we teach about making puppetry, do workshops for making puppetry. But we use puppetry as a tool to educate the public and to have forums on various subjects such as Native American culture and science, uh, dinosaurs, whatever. So you can say that you kind of, um, you made more of what you already did in this uh, center uh, during the pandemic years, but it also, you mentioned that you had good fundings. We know from other parts of the world, we know that the US uh, cultural budget is almost not existence on a national level as in many European countries, but you have other ways of uh, funding uh, a place like this center. Well, Vincent Anthony has been the master of fundraising. We definitely have a lot of commercial, well, let's say corporate sponsors, as well as the city of Atlanta and Folsom County and the state of Georgia and the United States government, which doesn't do a lot, but it's better than nothing. And during this process of the pandemic, loans were made to arts centers and theaters, as well as to, well, let's say chickens, chickens restaurant chains. They did have loans and we were able to get, uh, well, I say we, the center was able to get some of those loans and continues to function, but they had to cut a good percentage of their staff. And it's amazing what they managed to do. And, and we have to say also that uh, puppetry is very, really perfect for this kind of online things. It's the, the very old tradition of puppetry being uh, touring, being small, being relatively cheap is really an advantage when it comes to what you can do and not during the pandemic. Or am I wrong? Well, <laughs> no, of course, I, I, that's, that that's, gets to Fabricio's point. Traditionally, a lot of puppetry has been one or two people or small companies, and it is something you can do in a room alone. It was some of the pioneers of early television used puppetry because it was uh, physically uh, ad adequate to have just like say Bert Tilstrom in a booth doing a show. But now you have digital programming that's incredible. It uses all the latest technology. Yes, and, and uh, this, the aspects on the economy of, of puppetry, as well as other kind of theater, dance, and other performing arts, uh, that it is a considerable um, part of cultural life and also of social life in general. Idoya mentioned figures for Spain about uh, how, how large part of the audience is an audience of puppetry and that it must have, we must uh, learn uh, authorities and governments that this is an important part of uh, the cultural life as a whole. And I will, I'm turning to Daddy, and you're welcome to, to uh, interact, Nancy, to Daddy, who had uh, thought about this, about governments who are not really understanding uh, how much uh, money is in the culture and comes out of the cultural life. Right, Daddy? You, uh, we don't hear you. You have, to, sorry. Okay. Uh, hear me now? Yes. Yes, now we hear you. Uh, as we started, Loya as well mentioned about the, the importance of organizations, corporates, governments, uh, as also the UNESCO person on the panel today, the importance of nurturing art of uh, of assisting art most governments do not see art always as an industry and as uh, fabricio said maybe some of the artists get worried about this whole word industry or whatever but it's always a film or uh, you know opera who's bringing in income but that's not true every artist who's on stage has maybe uh, 12 to 30 people behind him or her. 
you know, people who clean the stage, people who make costumes, people who make decorations, people who make whatever, uh, set up lights, you know, technical stuff, as and, uh, Nancy just now said. And each of them are uh, getting their bread and butter or earning through art. And it's important that this filters down. It's not just high art in cities, but traditional artists in, in small towns and villages all over the world, Asia, Southeast Asia, families who are working, they may be even working on their own farms, but they still contribute something and to both to society as well as around when there's a festival, uh, Take, for instance, one of the largest things in Edinburgh, the festival creates economy in that city. I mean, people come in, things get sold. Uh, uh, take, for instance, Charleville. All, <laughs> all your rents in Charleville go up when the festival happens. So, you know, everybody's earning. But it's an important thing. I want to just read a few uh, uh, lines from Sanjoy Roy, who they've been doing research, teamwork arts on creating wealth, as they call it. Uh, he says, intervention through the arts creates wealth in a sustained manner, allowing people and their communities to find new ways of overcoming odds and finding unique solutions. Governments who believe that supporting the creative arts is about handouts, is about just giving aid, need to reassess their policies and invest in the future of its people and provide for sustained arts education to anchor the young to their traditions, culture, inheritance, and history. Uh, restoration, preservation and innovation and innovative use of heritage space or spaces leads to the tangible creation of wealth and a contribution to the local economy. And this has been seen in uh, India and in my country in many other countries. As the industrial revolution fades, the fourth, as the industrial revolution fades, the fourth revolution of creativity and technology will rule. And it's extremely important that our, uh, our governments, people, they, the artists that sometimes are used, you know, to propagate diplomats, uh, cultural diplomacy, things like that. But when it comes eventually to, to, to distress what has happened in this one year, uh, most, most of the artists, I, would, I, I can say about the puppeteers, have been assisted by civil society, by churches, by gurudwaras, the Sikh community all over the world, by UNIMA, by all sorts of you know, NGOs who have assisted artists. It hasn't always come through you know, large, large houses. And this is something important to realize, and we have realized this now. Yeah. Uh, would, would you say that there is a particular difficulty for puppetry because puppetry has not the same reputation as famous choreographers, famous opera directors. And I think uh, a general audience and critics and others have a, quite an old fashioned view on puppetry as something small, low and apart and most for children. In some ways it is true because uh, uh, it's still considered, uh, you know, down the rung, you know, puppetry. It may not be so in certain countries in Asia, where uh, traditionally it was very, you know, hard. But but new new forms of media have obviously taken over. Another problem that 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 persists is the meeting of uh, the medium and the message. Puppeteers, traditional puppeteers, have very strong techniques, have very, very you know, interesting materials. But what is stratified sometimes is the, 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 their history, the narrative. And that, as Fabrizio also said, there has to be a renaissance. But at times when there is a renaissance, it is the governing bodies who say that you're losing your tradition you know, that you are destroying your tradition, but tradition has never been static. It's never been sitting in a museum piece behind glass uh, cases. It has always been changing. Today, of course, it's changing very fast. So people are a little, you know, worried. Uh, and I must say something even to UNESCO because uh, I've all have said it and it's sometimes the bitter truth. Uh, 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 intangible heritage. At the, so there's a book by Sherif Kaznada. Who, who had propagated the whole thing of intangible heritage. But eventually he says that when you put that stamp, you say, this is what it is. And it is not uh, progressing anymore. 
And this is very important because uh, when you say that a certain style of puppetry or something, this is it, this is the stamp, this is the pure thing. But it, after, after that, what happens to it, you know? That is okay, then it becomes what you have as a showpiece, but then people create, traditional artists create, you know, it's never static. And this is something important for all of us to realize at some point of time, because that is the livelihood that will keep the art alive. So maybe maybe authorities and governments and others should need a, a lesson in puppet history to know better. Uh, Oksana, you have experienced yourself that you have to uh, really change a lot from the tradition uh, when uh, the pandemic struck uh, Russia, as many other countries. You, your theater company, the theater group, you changed completely uh, and, and uh, started to do outdoor things. Uh, please tell us about it. Uh, hello to everybody. First of all, I want to thank for the opportunity to take part in such great discussion. And uh, to begin with, uh, I want to uh, shortly introduce our group theater called uh, Eskiz of Prestranstvo. The translation is uh, Outlines in Space. And um, the reason that we choose this name is that we, um, the main instrument in our box is environment, area, and space. And uh, we do uh, from chamber performances to street performances. And during the period of pandemic, we specialized uh, uh, especially on uh, street performances. Uh, so um, we use uh, puppets, uh, life-size puppets in our street performances. And uh, uh, these puppets are large. Uh, with mechanisms and actors can manipulate them uh, or put them on the, their own back. Uh, so also the actors can dry them. Uh, and um, uh, because we uh, do performance in uh, street realities, it's uh, appropriate for, for all categories of spectators adults, children, for everyone. Um, and um, of course, um, during the period of pandemic, we try to uh, investigate new version of the theater and um, uh, investigate the, the village theater. We bought uh, the house outside the city in countryside and uh, made uh, it and the area nearby the house as a place we can perform. We uh, did uh, some workshops where they are creative laboratories and uh, also we uh, live there. Um, and uh, what's about the support? Uh, uh, in Russia, you can um, get some support like a citizen, not like uh, an artist. Yes, uh, there, there is a few uh, amount of uh, funds and state programs, uh, also private funds and state funds, but um, it's not enough <laughs> for, uh, for us. Um, also, um, I want to um, mention about the experience of uh, investigating the online performance but um, we uh, didn't um, satisfy with this experience because um, we decided that uh, the audience uh, has had overdose of the translation performances and so on. And uh, it, it uh, was hard to gather the audience um, uh, at computer screens. So um, it's, it's but were, were there not regulations in Russia? How many people could be in a street performance? Uh, for instance, you were supposed not to mingle and not to be too close to each other, maybe. How that yes. was not a problem? Or? Um, yes, uh, we um, uh, in our one performance called Lost Caravan. Um, uh, show uh, showed it um, in the 
uh, in the area in the uh, behind multi-story buildings in uh, a residential area uh, so uh, people uh, can um, watch this show through their own windows uh, from their apartments it's oh, like Yes, uh, it's um, according to uh, limitations and uh, restrictions. So, but uh, without <laughs> reducing uh, all the impression. Uh, so we are preparing Kimo the video that shows uh, the Russian theater group and their outdoor performances. It really, really, you start to long for a real theater festival, don't you? Where you can see things live again. But uh, this was amazing to see the big um, puppets, if we shall call them puppets, sculptures, or um, whatever we would like to call them. So uh, we are at this panel. We are people are coming from very different parts of the world, and as structures and economy is organized in different ways. And when I talked to Gilbert from uh, Togo, you said that it was uh, super complicated the time of the, uh, during the uh, pandemic, but that the pandemic opened a new page for puppetry. Tell us about it. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Margareta, for the opportunity. Uh, in the, this year of pandemic uh, surprised all of us. In March, a few days before the border closing and the arrival of the first case of COVID in Africa, we welcomed in Abidjan, uh, in never, every coast, the office of the International Unima led by Daddy and uh, Idwaya for a workshop and a very important meetings within the framework of MASA. Masai is the largest African entertainment market. It was an opportunity to confirm the ever increasing work of Africa perpetrators, the remarkable development of the art of poetry in Africa, more specifically in West Africa. The pandemic dealt a blow to this momentum. Once the borders were closed and the restrictions put in place by the various countries. The perpetrators have seen themselves cut off from their activities, their livelihoods, their reason of existing. It should be noted that art and culture have never been a priority for our African government. Most actresses have not support from the states, their states in Africa. This pandemic has plunged many artists into important financial, food, health, and economic crisis. 
impossible to create, to present shows, therefore to have incomes. Lack of structure to support artists in difficulties. It should be noted that in Africa, the majority of countries did not undergo containment during this pandemic. But cultural centers and spaces were closed for a time. The artists had to offer some of their creation to families at home, in houses, at school, at the market, in the church, in the villages and neighborhoods. Isolated audiences were offered show formally reserved for elites. Uh, Arbin imagination, creation, adaptation, a large part of African properties have to seek to adapt and find a way out to save themselves and their art, the art of property. This is how certain internet platforms have emerged in certain countries. It was necessary to meet via the internet, to consult together, to reflect, to find a way to resist, to survive, to save the artist and his art. Internationally, I can put an example, the WhatsApp group, African Puppeters, which brought together twice a week, nearly a hundred of puppeters for discussion and reflections. The remarkable work of the African Commission of UNIMA, which despite the pandemic, was able to organize meetings and online workshops. We must also note the remarkable presence of women in this sector today. Long excluded, women artists have started to take strong action in the artistic sector in Africa. Uh, the artistic offer of certain artists who have mutated from traditional practice to modern practice has been able to find markets in this period of pandemic. The aesthetic of the puppet, the practice had not left indifferent certain operators who have found it a means of awareness and promotion. This is how in some countries, the media, political, religious, economical, and social campaigns have found the puppets as the interlocutor despite the pandemic situation. And uh, that's the way we have tried in Africa to survive uh, to this uh, pandemic period, to work, to let the uh, artists uh, show their, their, their creation to public in their home, uh, in neighborhood, in church and uh, uh, in street. So, so uh, your conclusion is that the pandemic also uh, opened puppetry for a new audience, a new public. Yes. yes. And, and uh, now we will let in questions if there are questions from the from the also from the viewers and listeners to this round table and also between us before we go to a second part of the round table you can put questions and and uh, we will try to answer them and i will say the give you the first question to anyone among you if we didn't have internet if this pandemic had struck before we all were acquainted to uh, social media and Facebook and internet, what have happened? We, uh, you have to say that we have used it a very lot and it has served uh, the art forms very well. You, you look like answering daddy. You have to have your sound on sound, please. Uh, in many ways, I agree with that. It has also created a bit of a headache. But uh, I mean, schools, one year, still children aren't going to school and they are online. And the pressure is, of course, on the teachers because they're sitting and doing things which they never did before. And you're talking to a, you're, you're at times talking to an audience which is two dimensional. Uh, it's very different performing for a uh, live flesh and blood audience and and reactions that you can get when you're performing and uh online but yes uh, there has been a lot of i mean like today and uh, mm. uh, the 20 years ago i remember when we had a puppet uh, 
festival conference in Delhi. And uh, we had the modern puppeteers, we had the traditional puppeteers, and the traditional puppeteers, some of them came with their, uh, uh, with their, their, I wouldn't say hosts, but the people who supported them. So they were from the interior, and the person who was uh, uh, the philanthropist who managed to get them fill in the forms was maybe so-called educated uh, scholar or whatever from the city. And, uh, and, and one of them said, very, very well-known person, that, you know, why should there be any new work when the traditional artist or the puppetry is lying on his deathbed and everything is being plugged out and it's about to disappear. And many of us got up and said that maybe, but that it's a parallel thing. You have the tradition, you have new things, and you didn't come in a bullock cart or on a horse. You flew to Delhi from the south of India. You're sitting in an air-conditioned room today and discussing all this. Why should always the traditional artist sit in his own, you know, uh, thatched roof or mud house? He also or she also has aspirations, and things go wrong at times. But it. I think media or new uh, net or the technology has to be mm -hmm. used wisely. I think that is what is it, 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 it has also maybe uh, revealed some generation gaps. Not yes. everyone is familiar with the it's social not, media and Facebook. And uh, I think it's uh, for younger persons, it's not a problem at all. They are used to it. But on the other hand, a lot of middle aged people have learned to. Um, communicate by internet and to to uh, yeah to use it and uh, yeah uh, Clement is there some questions coming from our listeners or viewers or uh, maybe we should uh, the yes, there is uh, one question on the chat yes? it is uh, what recommendation do each of the panelists have in helping uh, Coupeter become more knowledgeable in advocacy and funding option in each of their respective country? Uh, this question is um, in the chat also. Yes, to everyone. Uh, can I read it in the chat? I do, do not see it. Uh, how uh, in the different countries uh, the puppeteers accommodate to the situation? Is that your question, Clément? Um, anyone among you who would like to answer to this? Um, or was it too uh, complicated a uh, question? No, Can, no. Uh, I, I, yes, I, I understand. Uh, I, I don't mm -hmm. know, but probably understand. In, in Italy, uh, Unima uh, worked in this direction. So it was uh, a place where it's possible to have information uh, UNIMA tried to help the people have a, a, a different moment, also like a Zoom, to meet a lot of people to give information about the possibility of money help to the government. So if I understand the question, this was the, the in which way it's possible to have more information for the help that arrived from the government for the uh, puppeteer. And I, I, I repeat, in Italy, Unima work, uh, Unima Italy work uh, for that a lot uh, during several months. So maybe also the pandemic woke up uh, Unima in some countries and, and make, uh, made the work more intense. Would you say that for Russia or Togo? You, you already mentioned it, Gilbert, I think. What about Russia? Is Unima more? alert today? Uh, I think uh, yes. And uh, uh, also I want to mention that uh, spectators and audience need indirect communication and uh, they uh, anyway uh, go to the theater and um, for, for, for watching, um, not by online, but uh, directly. The, uh, the energy of the performance and uh, the real emotions. Mm. Yes, uh, Nancy? I wanted to mention the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry, which is associated with the University of Connecticut and has a master's degree, master of fine arts degree program, 
have been very active in online exhibitions and forums discussing mm -hmm. the art of puppetry. So they're giving a lot of exposure to puppeteers and to thinking about puppetry and advocating for puppetry. So they've been a big help. But again, it's because they're funded by the university and a few donations so that the, it, it's always, this pandemic has helped spread the word about puppetry, but how do we find the money to sustain it? That's always, that's the question. That's a brilliant uh, thing to say before we have a little uh, intermission where we are going to see um, how uh, such a lot of uh, the UNIMA or, or, or puppetry that is a part of the UNESCO's list of heritage, uh, cultural heritage. And um, uh, to the viewers, maybe most of our viewers are very familiar with puppetry as an art form, but still, uh, it is a good thing to remind yourself how rich it is, how many different kind of puppetry techniques and storytelling there are, and how important part it always played in theatrical life. I think we will have a little look on this um, exposure of uh, puppetry as a cultural heritage, and then we will go on talking about uh, how the pandemic maybe also pushed uh, puppetry forward uh, in uh, terms of aesthetics. The video, please. Thank you. mentioned in, in the different uh, pieces is the year when it was when this kind of puppetry entered into the, the UNESCO list of cultural heritage. So um, we will uh, maybe you could say that pandemic created a lot of suffering and problems and it's still not over but uh, on the other hand it pushed forward some some activities and the art of puppetry was already in a period of uh, quick changes and developing and uh, cultural developing and, and a very interesting kind. And so uh, we will now talk a bit more about the aesthetic uh, side of the this tradition, this rich, rich tradition and modernist. And Fabrizio, you mentioned this, this uh, that we should stop to divide puppetry in either traditional puppetry or modern uh, tra uh, puppetry and uh, you wanted us to realize that this dichotomy is a fake uh, way of seeing the two sides of puppetry and uh, you had a new uh, thinking about the aesthetics for puppetry and new, new ideas for the aesthetic. Please tell. 
no, it's, it's not a new idea or new aesthetics, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that in 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 uh, in this period with uh, a lot of digital, a lot of uh, thinking, uh, the we 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 uh, are a lot in front of one screen and we are a lot of in this media world. So uh, I want to suggest one thing that uh, it is something that I try to develop for my idea of the shadow theater. And it's something that uh, is enormously close to my heart uh, is that the question of the ecology of the perception. Uh, I have always talked about this in relation to the shadow of theater. I am convinced that in a world dominated by a saturated, redundant, and intrusive images, shadow of theater finds its reason for being because is, uh, it is the bearer of a primitive and ancestral communication. The shadow theater has a visual uh, silence in the defining noise, noise uh, of the images that uh, surround us. Now, I would like to extend um, this concept also to the puppet theater as well. And uh, as an artist, I would like to plead with my colleagues for an ecology of perception. You can live uh, uh, badly due to an excess of air pollution, That's right? By the pollution of the seas, by the contamination of food. But I think that you can also live badly by the excess of words spoken and heard by the violence of the images absorbed, by the number of new languages invented that will never really be used. Are we for a sustainable world, we do economy of sign. Uh, we are sober. Are we for a sustainable world, we must defend diversity. We reject the total homologation of the artistic product that nullify the originality and authenticity of our creative act and to create dangerous adaptation to dominant models. This is my invitation uh, because I think that is, isn't that the job of an artist today? It, it, I think that uh, we need to do attention at this kind of problem. So I plead for an ecology of perception. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we will have a little look on this kind of silence in images from Teatro Jokovita, which is Fabrizio's uh, theater. I think Clemel is preparing, and maybe you will come back with some comments on this. Clemel, are you there? Yes. Yes. Uh, Fabrizio, uh, the Teatro Jokovita video clip.
Thank you. So would you like to comment on these beautiful pictures? I, we eat too much, we consume too much, we see too much, we hear too much. And it now is a time of, of uh, being more sober. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that uh, this is the function of the, an artist. If the society go too fast, we go slowly. Is, uh, we not need to go in the same direction of the society because uh, if, if we are totally agree, totally inside our society, we lost our, uh, our uh, prim primary function as an artist. Would you like to comment, Nancy? I know you had prepared a quote uh, about how it works when we digitalize uh, the performing arts uh, to the extent that we are doing now and uh, about this dichotomy tradition and uh, contemporary puppetry. Well, yes, I, uh, I got some notes from a friend of mine, Frank Prochan, who worked for years with the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage and the UNESCO Committee for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And he suggested there is very often a confusion between different purposes. If the intention is to generate revenue streams by repackaging a live performance for electronic dissemination and ticket sales, that's a very different purpose than if one is trying to create a documentary record for future researchers and or for feeding back into future creativity of other puppeteers. And both of these are very different purposes than creating a hybrid born digital work that could not exist without digital media. So he suggested that when we discuss digitization of puppetry, we think about the complexity of different kinds of intentions for the digitization and different, different presentations, different approaches and so on. And, and typical for our time is also we have all talked a lot about it. Globalization was a word that was uh, in our minds and comes together with internet and all the social media. We are just now fighting about the vaccine between the continents where uh, globalization has gone into a new, new phase. And uh, but for puppetry, the puppetry as an art form, cultural diversity always was very relevant and, and uh, different traditions melted together and, and were, uh, were traveling around the world. Uh, I know, Daddy, you have been working with a performance uh, recently that is, uh, you can say, based on the cultural diversity and how uh, different traditions could be combined. Maybe we would need more of this in our time. Again, uh, we can not just lean back and think globalization is done and that everyone sympathizes with it. Please tell us about this. And before we have a, a little look on this uh, from uh, some pictures this, from this performance. This performance uh, was created. Uh, it's now, well, last year is definitely disappeared, but it was, uh, it was commissioned by the National Center for Performing Arts. Once in a while, we get a good commission. And uh, it starts with actually handmade paper. And uh, Nita Premchan in Mumbai, in Bombay, used to research a special type of handmade paper, which was all made by these families, traditionally, in the middle of India, for Mughal miniature paintings. Extremely fine handmade paper. And today, due to the new BT genetic cotton, they cannot make this paper anymore because the cotton knots and it drops when they're lifting the paper. Anyway, so she, she illustrated three children's books on the stories of the flood. Everybody knows Noah's Ark flood, but there's a Gilgamesh story about immortality. There is a thing on Manu in India, which is also about the flood. And the, 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 the National Center said, we would like to put these three stories together with especially a symphonic museum, which was created, uh, uh, written by Ira Ishmaruto, Tata Russian, who now lives in Canada, very pro prolific composer. And it will be played live. 
that is where your technology helped. I'm sitting here, this composer in Canada, other people in Mumbai, the conductor is somewhere else. And we were working on this and eventually it all came together just one day before the performance in Mumbai. But the stories start with this texture of handmade paper and block printing. And the idea is to say that as human beings, we all and the core are the same. Uh, all our stories are very similar and we are the same. So instead of, uh, you know, creating the divisions, let us, let us celebrate our diversity. And that's how these three stories were put together. Of course, it's difficult because up to they get into the boat, they're different. But once in the boat and the flood comes, everything happens the same. And in researching the flood stories, every culture, every history, every geography has a flood story in this world. It is amazing. And they're all very similar. You know? So anyway, uh, that's how when land becomes water happened. And it also talks about a bit about ecology, you know, uh, different things. And, and water is what is connecting also these continents. And so the narrator, the girl, she represented uh, water, you know, female energy. You can have a look in the question. And, in, and, and, and technology did drive us crazy because there was digital projection, shadow, there were different things. So uh, sometimes I feel we try to be too much instead of getting simpler, you know, in performing. And I have noticed that in the years now that sometimes we are losing the, the simplicity, the humor, you know, things that, and that I say for myself as well, because, uh, you know, from where you start and then you carry on and then you come back to something that you started. Yeah, yeah we will have a look, Clément. Yeah. of all that grew and seven wise men. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, as a critic, I must also made a remark that more and more uh, dance is uh, very close to puppetry. It's a lot of uh, dance in puppetry performances. A lot of movement. No, in, uh, a lot of yes. movement. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe that that inspiration originally comes from Stockholm, from Michael Meshke, and using the, the live actor and the puppeteer in, from the school when I was there, and puppetry more for adults as well, not just kids. And yeah, and we are performing this tomorrow on World Puppet Day to a live audience. Let's see how many people come, but it's happening tomorrow at 4 p.m. on stage. But with a recorded track, not with a sit. But uh, I think also Fabrizio has made performances with dancers and yeah. shadows. And I think I see this a bit everywhere. And I call movement, but I will call it dance. And uh, also and the di diversity of, yeah, sorry. An interesting quote again from Meshke uh, uh, that use puppetry as a means, not as an ends in itself. Use puppetry as a means of telling the story, not just as a be all and all and ends in itself. And so you are using movement, dance, theater, uh, text, whatever. This was something. Yeah, more and more uh, puppetry is what was called by early modernism, Gesamtkunstwerk, a total piece of art. And, and also the diversity, uh, Oksana, the caravan we saw, it's based on an Arabic uh, story, isn't it so? Uh, is uh, it is uh, made uh, uh, as a result of inspiration of traveling through some countries of our group uh, from uh, through India, for example, and Turkey. And so uh, these uh, uh, impressions of uh, traveling uh, through these countries uh, allows allow us to create uh, the performance Lost Caravan. And uh, this is uh, about uh, fragility and uh, beauty of our world. Um, about, um, so, okay. Uh, the performance, uh, it's uh, necessary to mention, is a procession. It's not a stable story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's move uh, like a real caravan. Uh, of uh, mythical animals, uh, it, it is... Um, played by uh, large uh, cane puppets that controlled by actors. And actors are um, unusual masked uh, characters, uh, which, is, uh, which seems like uh, shamans or dervishes. And uh, the caravan appear from nowhere and uh, going through the crowd uh, makes, makes some stop where um, we can observe some dance, some uh, battles uh, behind uh, some group of characters. And uh, the, this performance is the poetic action of mm -hmm. uh, a mystical nature. Now, at least we are having some interesting questions coming and we will soon come back to the questions uh, before we uh, also let uh, Gilbert talk again and we will see some uh, video also from uh, your activities. You, in, you mentioned that um, you this, we are going to see uh, performances with uh, live uh, size puppets for instance and uh, you have told us that uh, puppetry is developing very well but there is one thing missing that would help and support the art form and that is administration and your wish for something as a kind of education, how to become admin an administrator in puppetry to have a producer, for instance. Could you tell us a little about this? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks to this pandemic, uh, uh, internet platforms and social medias uh, brought together African puppeteers. Uh, they understood how important it is to work together as a solid network to develop their arts. This pandemic has made us realize the great gaps that most African artists have between the artistic and administrative. Uh, today, they have artistic proposal of remarkable quality, but our structures 
are not sufficiently competent in administration to make our creations profitable. There is a brief training question that arises. Our artists have benefited from several artistic training, but not administrative. During this pandemic, only companies that have certain administrative skills were able to size the, uh, the few opportunities that presented themselves. It is undoubtedly that we have local competence, which only have wants a framework to initiate the structuring of the various company and artistic associations to allow them a financial autonomy and a profitable competitiveness. One of our projects set up in uh, uh, 2019 is a project called Women in Creation, co-founded by Interact and European Union uh, through Kawa, Culture at Work Africa, which bring together about 15 women from several countries in West Africa sub-region. This project allows participants to train and initiate projects between themselves. Uh, so today, many of them arise themselves internationally, having their own association, initiating festivals for female creations. The Maru Network that we set up five years ago, which is an African network uh, of festival in public space, has given a major boost to the art of property in Africa. Today, we have 15 festivals from 10 African, uh, 10 African member countries. And this network allow artists to have some uh, training in administration, production, and this network allow artists to see their creation scheduled at several festivals in this network. This is considered response to the local economy. Artists are not obliged today to go to Europe or America before being paid for their creation. It is possible for the artists make profitable their creation locally in Africa. Uh, I, I'm talking about this training because during this uh, pandemic year, I was, uh, uh, I was asked to help uh, more than 10 companies over the, uh, uh, from uh, several countries in Africa to build projects. You see, it's very difficult. They, they, have, they have remarkable proposal, they have creation, but, but, but they, they, don't, they don't have administrative skill to 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 present to 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 present this creation to let artists be uh, paid for their work. That's why I'm saying is very very important for we African pro producers or uh, even uh, puppeters to be trained locally because we have economic uh, we have locally economic attitude to be profitable for our creation. Thank you. Thank you. There's, uh, that's interesting remarks about the need for uh, more knowledge in also uh, how to make institutions for puppetry solid. I think we have are having some very interesting questions and I asked the panelists to think about at least two of them about the future. Can, how would you think about the future for puppetry? Do you have an image of how would it look like the future of puppetry? And the other question is tomorrow is, as we all know, puppetry, word puppetry day. And uh, does it have an, an importance? And uh, I will ask uh, Clement to let us see the video from uh, West Africa, from uh, Togo and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And we will go to the questions afterwards. And then we have to think about the time as well. Okay, thank you, Clément. I'm <laughs> 
Thank you again, uh, puppetry close to dance, I would say. So uh, anyone among you who would like to say something about the future for puppetry? Uh, how would you imagine the future for puppetry in the world as we know it today? Big question, but uh, who is courageous enough? Fabrizio, do you think it will? we will long for the silence of the shadows? <laughs> no, I I am a good confidence. So I think that uh, 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 I, I don't know in all the world because uh, I know uh, Europe, but uh, in Europe uh, we need the puppet theater. We need uh, of the puppet theater in the theater in general. Uh, I, I think that we need the quality of imagination that the puppet theater uh, represent and uh, put on the stage. Uh, we need uh, the puppet theater because uh, I think that is one way to tell about the world that is very uh, contemporary. So we need of this. The question is that we are able to to build a solid institutions because I think that if I uh, if you, you you have no school is like that you are no recognized. Why no school in a lot of country of puppets? So if when you have one school you have you are recognized because the people recognize that you need of training. And this is the first step, but so we need to build something that is solid and during and uh, help us to go to do one very important step. Uh, this is the moment to do this, to open our world, to go in the world completely, uh, 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 we, 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 uh, in, in, in the way, in an artistic way, the, the uh, world of the puppetry is very open. It has space of freedom, but in other way is very closed. So I think I, 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 I wonder that in the future we are able to have the same freedom, not only in the aesthetic way, or the, uh, but also in the social way. You sound optimistic, that's nice. You know, the future 
starts tomorrow and tomorrow is puppetry world puppetry day and for this day there is a message from uh, Madame Audrey Azoulay, who is Director General of the UNESCO. This uh, whole speech and message is exposed on the internet, of course, and on the whole pages of UNESCO and UNIMA. But she says that uh, the pandemic has reminded us just how much we need puppets, evocative and inspiring power. And that's uh, something to quote and to carry with us. I see, Daddy, that you would like to answer on, is, there, is this important with the word puppetry day? Is it, is it useful? Well, you have to put on your sound, yeah. Thank you. uh, well, this is a what World Puppetry Day? The first World Puppetry Day was celebrated in 2003. And uh, uh, it was actually in the Magdeburg Congress that uh, Margaret and Nicholas who had proposed that we should have a special day and then the meeting in Atlanta, it was proposed and in 2000, it became 2002 and 2003, it was initiated for the first time. And since then, every year we've celebrated this day. This day also falls tomorrow 21st, which is the vernal equinox. And in one whole part of the earth, the planet, which is Central Asia, all it is called now Rose, which means the new day, it's the new year. And in most, right from say somewhere in the Middle East, it goes right to the East, including Easter that comes in because in, tomorrow all these people celebrate now Rose and eggs are put in and nature is uh, worshipped and you know, seeds and it's spring, first day of spring in, in this part of the world. And, and it came into that, and every year, an important person, a personality, a puppeteer writes a message. And uh, since the last few years, we've also been uh, commissioning a poster, which is done by an artist. This year, it is by the Syrian girl. Last year, it was a Brazilian puppeteer. And each time somebody comes, and I, I think seeing the seeing from where it started, it's suddenly grown. Uh, everywhere there is uh, in little towns and villages here at least they're all making little puppets and for tomorrow celebrating making videos wishing each other and it is growing so i think it it gives some sort of uh, i don't know if it's just superficial but it does give some sort of uh, 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 projection to puppetry all over the world i mean even people some who don't know about it tomorrow when we'll be performing in this theater the message will be read out the, the, the UNESCO message lady who's written it, that will be read out and everybody is trying something or the other. So I think it is special. It makes, and it gives us also a pride of place, puppeteers. Yes, and I, I think it's like what Fabrizio just said about schools and trainings. I mean, it's a kind of, it gives visibility to the art form and it is a kind of manifest for the art forms. Now there were some uh, in, in other questions about more like comments maybe, but, uh, and also someone pointing out that if you want to know more about Africa in the time of pandemic, there is a special resilient on Africa uh, among all these uh, 19 resilient conversations. And that goes for, if you look at the UNIMA homepage, you will see uh, that there are other ones, specialized Scandinavia and Korea and so on. And, and they are very informative for anyone who would like to know more about a specific uh, tradition and the region. But I think uh, uh, we are getting close to the end of this um, round table, which really was very round. And I hope you feel that uh, you had uh, place and time enough to say what you wanted. If someone would like to add something uh, special, now is the time. Nancy, please. Well, I just wanted to point out that the Muppets have reached millions of people around the world. And it shows that electronic media can be used to a popular end, not just to documentation and not just uh, teaching, but the idea that the Muppets are being even streamed now and the Dark Crystal has a prequel and so on. And so it's a question of artistic ingenuity can use the digital uh, forms to be an incredible tool for puppetry. 
Yeah, why wise word, and and uh, I think this panel has uh, at large been fairly optimistic. It is a very difficult situation during the pandemic, but uh, uh, many interesting and good things has been shown, and and many puppeteers has uh, been more communicating to each other than ever. Uh, uh, Clément and Idoya, are there other things that should be highlighted uh, or can we say that we are getting to an end of this interesting round table and there are some uh, comments that it has been very interesting and that's nice to hear, I hope so. I would like to say that uh, uh, a report of this, all these resilient uh, roundtables will be done and will be um, present in the Congress, in the Congress of UNIMA that will be in, in April and that will be online. And uh, a resume of all these uh, resilient roundtables will be presented. there. And I think it will be really very, very interesting. That's uh, all from my side. Uh, and thanks again to everybody for, for your very, very interesting participation. participation. Thank you. I think- yes, th I think Thank I'll, you to everyone. Yeah, Daddy. I think our World Puppet Day tomorrow is one of the most important ones of all the problems and all the difficulties that everybody has gone through in this whole last year. I, and we hope, we pray that it's a new beginning of the tomorrow. I hope it's possible. And I think we have to think positive because everyone has gone so deep into all their problems, this, that. We've also realized that because of Resiliot, that we're not alone. Every, the same problems are happening all across the globe. And, uh, you know, there is a solidarity and I hope that we can come out of it and, and yeah, and be happy. And that the, and that the, uh, Regarding what you are saying, the, the message of, of Audrey Azule is very important for us. The yeah. support of Audrey in the, this special year is very, very important for puppetry art and for puppeteers. I just quoted a few lines from it, but the whole of it will be uh, possible to read at UNIMA's homepage as well. I would uh, just like to thank uh, Clément and Emmanuel for excellent preparations of this round table. And Idoya, of course, and uh, everyone responsible in UNIMA and UNESCO. And I think this is, of course, it was longer than expected, the round table, it always is. But thank you, everyone. And I will uh, say that this is all for today. And uh, maybe we will meet in another round table or at the Congress. So bye bye and thank you for now. <laughs>